for many years, for the past half a century or longer, uh, it hasn't just been the Austrians who have been uh, uh, critical of government intervention. Uh, the University of Chicago became famous uh, in the post-war era as the Chicago School, and Milton Friedman himself, most of you, maybe all of you have heard of Milton Friedman, the young students in the audience, if you haven't, uh, look him up uh, and find out who Milton Friedman was if you have any interest in economics at all. And, uh, you know, he was a big critic uh, and leader of the Chicago School, and they they uh, pretty much criticized government intervention of all kinds, uh, you know, all, uh, all kinds of regulatory policy, monetary policy, uh, as well as the Austrians. And But there was one thing about the uh, Chicago School critics that uh, always sounded kind of funny to me, and that uh, they would never really call for the abolition of a lot of institutions like the Fed or, or antitrust, uh, for example. Uh, Friedman was famous uh, for most of his career as being an advocate of something called a monetary rule. He thought if the Fed could only allow the money supply to grow at, say, 4% forever, that would be just keen, peachy, that would be wonderful. Uh, the Austrians never uh, took that position because uh, inflation is inflation. It'll create the malinvestment problems that, that it always creates, even if it's only 4%. But by the end of his life, Milton uh, understood that uh, uh, this is kind of crazy because it relies on a sort of a benevolent despot to enforce the monetary rule. And we don't have benevolent despots, we have politicians. And so later in his life, he decided, you know, what have I been doing all these years? Uh, he himself, uh, you know, abandoned that idea. Uh, but still, you didn't see uh, many Chicago people advocating uh, abolition of the Fed altogether and return to sound money in a gold standard. And, uh, and uh, so this, this whole area of banking, money and banking, has been the most immune of all the areas of economics to the, the critiques by the anti-interventionists, uh, not by the Austrians, but even by the, the people who are known as being critics of government intervention, like the Chicago School, have, have uh, really been not, not nearly as critical as, as you would think. And so I thought uh, I would uh, uh, put together a little survey of some of the kinds of things that the mainstream says that I think uh, are pretty easy to show are, are false. And these are things that are taught um, primarily to college students, but also the general public. And by mainstream, I don't mean uh, just the academic world. Uh, I'm going to start talking about um, the New York Fed, for example. Uh, the Fed publishes a lot of things, a lot of publications. A lot of these publications are used in classrooms. A lot of them are the basis for what is written in textbooks about such things as the founding of the Fed. And I have here a Fed publication. It's by the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. It's entitled The Founding of the Fed. And it's sort of, you read this, and I, I started thinking, where have I heard this story before? And, oh, yeah, the Immaculate Conception. That, that's where I heard about this before. I heard this, uh, you yeah, know, that's where I heard this same story. It sounded familiar to me. And so, uh, and they start, you know, the Fed wasn't created until 1913, but they start at the very beginning of the founding of the first central bank, which was called the Bank of the United States, 1791. And here's one of the things that the New York Fed said. And even when I was a college student, I can remember being told the New York Fed is the most important of all the Fed banks. And we were supposed to remember that. He said, they're saying this about the first central bank. The bank's charter ran for 20 years, and when it expired, chaos quickly ensued brought on by the lack of a central regulating mechanism over banking and credit. So while, while chaos didn't ensue, the War of 1812 ensued, is what ensued. And so, and so what happened was after the War of 1812, the Bank of the United States was resurrected. Uh, it went back in business in 1817, and it quickly uh, created the Panic of 1819. That was the title of Murray Rothbard's doctoral dissertation at Columbia, uh, which is also a book, and I think it's online at Mises.org. And so there wasn't a panic, uh, but there was, there was one man who I'm pretty sure was in a panic, and Rothbard explains this. So here's where the real panic was. Uh, in, in, in his history of money and banking in the United States, uh, Rothbard uh, explains the, the, the political impetus for bringing back the original central bank, the Bank of the United States. Okay, and here's what he says. The second bank of the United States, that's what it was called, the second bank of the United States, was pushed through Congress, particularly by Secretary of the Treasury Alexander J. Dallas, 
a wealthy Philadelphia lawyer and close friend, counsel, and financial associate of Philadelphia merchant and banker Stephen Gerard, reputedly one of the two wealthiest men in the country. Gerard was the largest stockholder of the First Bank of the United States, and during the War of 1812, Gerard became a very heavy investor in the war debt of the federal government. As a way to unload his public debt, Gerard began to agitate for a new Bank of the United States that would buy up the debt, and of course it did. So I imagine Gerard was in a panic at the end of the War of 1812 when he thought no one would buy all this debt that he, that he had purchased. And so, so what happened then? Uh, well, here's what Rothbard writes, that the Second Bank of the United States, quote, launched a spectacular inflation of money and credit, and it promptly created the Panic of 1819, the first real depression in American history. Uh, for example, there was, for the first time ever, there was large-scale unemployment in cities. Um, Rothbard mentions uh, Philadelphia, where there was uh, employment in manufacturing of handicrafts fell from 9,700 people in 1815 to only 2,100 in 1819. That's quite a drop in employment in, you know, just in a single city. And so even you know, like the first paragraph of this New York Fed publication on the founding of central banking is, is totally dubious and, and, and really uh, false. But here's the page two of this. Uh, they go on, this is a historical chronology. They say America's central banking was carried on uh, well, well, let me uh, interject, uh, interrupt myself. They go on to talk about the Second Bank of the United States and how uh, Andrew Jackson actually vetoed the rechartering of it in the 1830s, so the Second Bank of the United States went out of business also. So here we are after that, after the 1830s. Uh, the New York Fed publication says, America's central banking was then carried on by a myriad of state-chartered banks with no federal regulation. The difficulties brought about by this lack of a central banking authority hurt the stability of the American economy. Bank notes issued by the individual banks varied widely in reliability. Imagine that. To its detriment, the American public had again, again opposed the idea of a central bank, the stupid American public. And the country's need for such an entity was more apparent than ever before. And I'll think about this. Uh, when, I, when I read this, I, I thought to myself, well, Let's change the words here. Instead of bank or central bank, let's put grocery store and see how this sounds. America's grocery store industry was carried on by a myriad of competing grocery stores with no federal regulation. The difficulties brought about by this lack of a central planning authority hurt the stability of the American economy. Grocery stores by, uh, varied widely in reliability. That's supposed to be a bad thing. To its detriment, the stupid American public had again opposed the idea of a centrally planned grocery industry, and the country's need for such an entity was more apparent than ever before. So competition is to be outlawed in money at all, at all times. We can't allow competition uh, among bankers, uh, you know, of all things. That would be a disaster. And then they, they, they sort of their pain to monopoly continues. And when they, they sing the praises of, the, uh, of Lincoln's National Currency Acts of 1863, which, quote, sought to add clarity and security to the banking system. And so that's why it's like the immaculate conception. Every time the government intervenes, it's clarity and security, whereas when there's competition, it's, uh, you know, it's unreliability and chaos and, and, and so forth. Uh, these banks were now subject to stringent capital requirements and were required to collateralize currency notes with what? With gold? No. With holdings of United States government securities. Uh, more oversight and a more robust currency in circulation was the result. A more robust currency in circulation. Yeah, the inflation of the Civil War. That's, that's what more, more robust uh, currency. Uh, but another thing the Fed always does is every time it advocates a type, a new type of intervention, and that intervention creates bad results, the answer is always, well, we don't have enough power. Uh, you know, Ben Bernanke is not the first one to say this, that that's the, that's the problem. There's not enough power in the hands of the Fed. Uh, here's what the New York Fed said about this, uh, this system, uh, the Lincoln regime uh, system. The national banking legislation of the 1860s proved inadequate because of inability of the banking system to expand or contract 
currency in circulation. This led to wild gyrations in the economy. So there was a, you know, there was a nationalization of the money supply, a massive regulation of the banking system by the federal government. And they make no, there's no mention here that there might be cause and effect there. The, 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 the interpretation they give is that, well, the problem was, that uh, we don't have enough power. Yes, we greatly expanded our power over money in the 1860s, but not enough. So it's always it's always the result. Uh, it's always what they're pleading for. And then they go on to take uh, uh, to, to explain the creation of the actual Fed, which other people have discussed here today. And but here's the creepiest thing they say about the the actual Fed being created: a key event leading to America's financial reform was the election of Woodrow Wilson as president. So that's, that's kind of scary. It's, we're kind of close to Halloween, so I thought I'd, uh, I thought I'd, I'd, put, I'd put that in. That, that should say something to you if it took someone, a creep like uh, Woodrow Wilson, to get the Fed, the, the Fed through. Um, so, well, that's uh, one example of, of what I believe to be miseducation about the history of central banking. Anyway, just one little publication. Uh, and and there, are, there are many like this. Uh, another thing I did is I, I wrote down some quotes about what some, uh, some of the better known economics textbooks say about, um, this, about the creation of the Fed and the role of the Fed in the money supply. And uh, uh, to add a little history here, uh, the, the biggest selling economics textbook in the world by far from 1948 until about the 1980s was the one by Paul Samuelson, Paul Samuelson's Economics. And then uh, around that time, Samuelson took on a co-author named William Nordhaus. And so and it continued for, you know, for many years to be published as Samuelson and Nordhaus. And uh, it, all during m this time, even the competing textbooks were just uh, clones of Samuelson's book for the most part. There were a few outliers, there were a few differences, but for the most part, the big, big sellers that were used to teach hundreds of thousands of college students every year were either the, the point of view of Paul Samuelson or people who uh, were sort of Paul Samuelson wannabes. And here's, here's one statement from the 16th edition, 1998, that, that, I dug, that happened to be in my uh, university library. The, and this is what college students have always been taught. The Federal Reserve's central goal is low and stable inflation. Hold your laughter, please. It also seeks to promote steady growth in national output, low unemployment, and orderly financial markets. You know, think of George Selgin's charts when I'm reading this, this stuff. If aggregate demand is excessive and prices are bid up, the Federal Reserve Board may reduce the growth of the money supply. That puts the brakes on the economy and reduces price pressures. And so the economists, mainstream economists, are always making these metaphors. The economy is like an automobile. You know, we hit the gas and we hit the brakes and, and we steer the economy. And that, that's how they view, they view the economy. Uh, if the economy is sluggish and business languishing, the Fed may consider increasing the money supply. That will usually give a boost to aggregate demand and bring down unemployment. Um, how's it working today? They, they, they've been boosting a lot, haven't they? Then another quote from Samuelson and Nordhaus, they say, above all, the Federal Reserve is an independent agency, and they, independent is in big black uh, print. The Fed listens politely, but generally chooses the path it thinks best for the country. And so there's this like godlike people up there who have no, you know, no personal interests at all. They listen politely to what the politicians say, even the politician named the president who gets to reappoint the chairman of the Fed, uh, but they'll tell him to get lost if they think he's saying something that they don't approve of. That, that's what Samuelson and Nordhaus are, are, are saying. Then one final statement from Samuelson and Nordhaus. The Fed is ultimately concerned with preserving the integrity of our financial institutions and combating inflation. Uh, and think of that chart that George George had up here. I think it was George had the chart of uh, inflation from 1787, you know, 8% until 1913, and then, you know, the dollar devalued by, you know, uh, down to three cents of the original value of the dollar from 1913 to, to today. Uh, and so, uh, you know, as far as the integrity of financial institutions, I couldn't help, uh, it reminded me uh, of one of my favorite Fed publications, uh, this one was by the Boston Fed, and uh, this has to do, this is an example of how the, the Fed uh, preserves the integrity of our financial institutions. Uh, 
This was a, a pub publication that the Boston Fed printed up and sent out en masse to, uh, to mortgage lenders. Uh, just uh, not necessarily even the ones who were uh, members of the, of the Federal Reserve System, just mortgage lenders, you know, everywhere. And it's called Closing the Gap, a Guide to Equal Opportunity Lending, Mortgage Lending. Uh, you see there's a gap uh, between, uh, in lending for, for houses between people who can afford a mortgage and people who cannot afford a mortgage. And we need to close that gap, the Boston Fed is saying. That's what, it's online. Go online and just said Boston Fed closing the gap. You'll find this, this thing. And so, and the Fed says to all these mortgage lenders, they say this, these are just suggestions, just suggestions. But then they say failure to comply with the, the Equal Credit Opportunity Act or Regulation B can subject a financial institution to civil liability for actual and punitive damages in individual or class actions. So they say we're only suggesting this, but it's sort of a gun under the table suggestion, isn't it? They threaten massive class action lawsuits if you don't comply. And so what did Closing the Gap recommend? What are the recommendations? Uh, well, the recommendation number one is Ignore traditional measures of credit worthiness when it comes to minority and low income consumers. So, uh, you know, don't, that's where the no doc loans came from. You know, don't, don't even give us a pay stub. Uh, not two, traditional ratios of mortgage payments to monthly income can also be ignored. Don't worry about it. We need to close the gap. Uh, three, lack of credit history should not be a factor either. Successful participation in credit counseling is an adequate substitute. So if you have bad credit, you go to a, a Fed-appointed counselor, and that is supposed to be a substitute for a good credit rating, according to the Fed. Uh, the fourth word of advice uh, that the Fed gave to uh, mortgage lenders was this. If a subprime borrower has a property appraisal problem, then the Fed or Fannie Mae could help to find another experienced appraiser. <laughs> so I bought and sold quite a few houses in, in my time. And, and if I got an appraiser and I didn't like the number he came up with and found another one, I'm pretty sure I could get in pretty big trouble, maybe even go to jail for, for, uh, for something like that, at least be fine. But here's the Fed telling, you know, we'll, we'll send you an appraiser to give the right number for the appraisal so that you can get the loan. And so, and this was in the past 10 years, 10, 10 or 12 years that this was going on. So this was all part of the Fed's uh, policy of um, what Samuelson and Nordhaus say is preserving the integrity of our financial institutions. Um, and uh, of course, uh, I don't think they did any such thing. Uh, another, all during this time that I mentioned that Paul Samuelson's uh, book was so popular, the second biggest seller during this era of the, uh, maybe not the whole era, maybe pretty much the 60s and 70s was a textbook, a, a really bad textbook by uh, Campbell McConnell. And I can remember one of my professors that uh, I went to school, at, uh, they call it Virginia Tech now because they have a decent football team, but it was mostly an engineering school when I was there. So it was Virginia Polytechnic Institute when I was there, but now, or VPI, now it's Virginia Tech. But uh, I can remember one of my professors getting this book and throwing it out the window. He threw it out the classroom window again. Because it wasn't his book. It was, he walked into the classroom and that book was there, Campbell McConnell. So he just walked over the window and threw it out, <laughs> threw it out. bad book. And this was the same guy who used human action as a textbook in the, in the, in the class I was taking. And, so, and, and that's a memorable thing. But anyway, just like uh, Samuelson, this book sold and sold and sold. And, uh, and uh, McConnell sort of, sort of went into semi-retirement and took on a co-author named Stanley Rue, who, uh, so it's McConnell, Brew rather, so it's been McConnell and Brew for, forever, the 14th edition. Uh, I'm going to quote the 14th edition. In the early 20th century, Congress decided that centralization and public control were essential for an efficient banking system. Decentralized, unregulated banking had fostered inconvenience and confusion of numerous banknotes being used as currency. No single entity was charged with creating and implementing rationally consistent banking policies. And again, think of that, just change the words grocery to, to banking. Uh, you know, decentralized, unregulated grocery stores had fostered inconvenience and confusion of numerous grocery stores to choose from. It's, so there's a menu problem. 
if you have competition, you're going to have competition. You're not going to have a, a monopoly uh, by, by definition. So they, they, they inform students that this is a bad thing, having, having a central planning authority is what we need. Uh, then one other quote that I picked from their book about the Fed, the policies of central banks follow are designed by the Board of Governors to promote the well-being of the economy as a whole. It is therefore inconsistent with the profit motive. How many of you think the bailout of Goldman Sachs is inconsistent with somebody making profits? Anybody? Uh, so um, I don't think too many people would think of that. So that's the that's the kind of uh, uh, stuff uh, college students have been subjected to for, for many, many years. Uh, a, th a third example of uh, how the so-called mainstream miseducating, and I don't mean every single person who considers themselves mainstream and everything, but they're just, these are, but these are some prominent examples I'm giving here from these textbooks. Um, the Wall Street Journal, that's a pretty, uh, uh, most of my friends call it the War Street Journal or the Regime Street Journal. Uh, Wall Street Journal is what most people think of it as. Uh, when the when the real estate bubble burst and we entered this depression that we're in, they featured an article by John Steele Gordon, uh, who is a very well known business historian. And uh, I've read a lot of his a lot of his books. I think a lot of them are really good books and on a lot of all kind of topics. He's he's written uh, he writes a lot, a lot of popular writing. Uh, I even tried to get his book uh, chosen, one of his books chosen as the one book that all freshmen at my universities read. Universities do this. They pick one book. and uh, But uh, the feminists that were on the committee threw a, a fit, a screaming fit, because there weren't enough women in, in his book on the history of entrepreneurship in, in there, even though it was actual real history. And then, you know, today it would be different. I mean, if it, if it was, if it was, you know, entrepreneurship in America in the post-60s, there would be a lot of women in there, in there, but this was a you know, history book. But anyway, so, so I kind of like a lot of what Gordon does, but I was kind of taken aback at this. This is one of the first articles that the, 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 uh, the journal you know, highlighted uh, to explain the causes of the crisis. And here's the cause, John Still Gordon. He blames the current uh, economic crisis on, quote, the baleful influence of Thomas Jefferson. So it's Thomas Jefferson's fault that we had this, this crisis. So where is he coming from? He says, well, the purpose of the Fed is, quote, to guard the money supply, regulating the economy thereby. And, of course, Jefferson was uh, a, uh, the opponent of Alexander Hamilton, the father of central banking in America. That, that's, what, that's what the Fed itself calls him. The Fed has, not the New York Fed, but the Fed Fed has a publication called A History of Central Banking in America, and they call Hamilton the founding father of central banking in America. And in this publication, they even say uh, he even sounded like a modern-day Fed chairman. Hamilton did. And, uh, and I've read all of Hamilton's famous reports on economics and I've written a book on Hamilton, Hamilton's Curse, and I would agree with that. Uh, it's it's a lot of what he writes on economics topics is is sort of idiotic, uh, impossible to understand, a jumble of sentences that aren't connected. It, it's just like Alan Greenspan, uh, if, you, if, you, if you read this stuff. I used to tell the students that Greenspan reminded me of my old uncle who had dementia before he passed away. You know, I'd, I'd go and visit him, and he'd talk and talk and talk, and it sounded just like Alan Greenspan uh, testifying before Congress. Uh, but Jefferson was the mortal enemy of central banking at the very beginning. He, he and uh, Hamilton both made the case for and against the bank to George Washington, and George Washington signed the legislation, but it was only because uh, he cut a political deal, and uh, the Federalist uh, promised to move the boundary of Washington, D.C. to be adjacent to Mount Vernon, George Washington's property in Virginia, if he would sign the bank bill, which he did. Okay, he was a politician, after all. You don't get to be the top general if you're not a politician. Uh, and so what else does Gordon say about this? Uh, so he, he, his basic point is that this whole tradition, this anti-central banking tradition, started with Jefferson and plagues us today, plagues us to this day. And then, and then the real reason for the crisis is that the Fed is not powerful enough. Uh, 
if only we could get rid of these Jeffersonians and, uh, you know, they hide behind this weird sounding guy, Ludwig von Mises now. They, they don't call themselves Jeffersonians anymore. Uh, they might call themselves something else. But uh, if, we, if we didn't have these critics of the Fed, we wouldn't have had this depression, is, is the argument in the article. And uh, on Jefferson, he, this is a standard line of these people. He calls, he says, uh, he hated commerce, he hated banks, and may not have understood the concept of central banking. Uh, this is nonsense. Uh, Jefferson, what Jefferson was opposed to was uh, mercantilism. He opposed Hamilton's plan of a bank run by politicians out of the nation's capital that would spend money on corporate welfare and have, and have protectionist tariffs. That's what he opposed. He didn't oppose banking per se. He opposed the idea of a bank run by politicians and, and, and the policies of taxing farmers to subsidize uh, manufacturers. That's what he opposed, not manufacturing in general. Here's what Rothbard says about this. He said, Jefferson was very precisely in favor of laissez-faire or free market capitalism. And that was the real argument between Hamilton and Jefferson. It wasn't really that Jefferson was against factories or industries per se. What he was against was coerced development, that is, taxing the farmers through tariffs and subsidies to build up industry artificially, which was essentially the Hamilton program and also the John Steele Gordon program. Jefferson was a very learned person. He read Adam Smith. He read Ricardo. He was very familiar with laissez-faire classical economics. And so his economic program was a very sophisticated application of classical economics to the American scene. The classicists were also against tariffs, subsidies, and coerced economic development. The Jeffersonian wing of the founding fathers was essentially free market laissez-faire capitalists. This was from an essay that Murray Rothbard wrote entitled A Future of Peace and Capitalism. And it was, it's online at Mises.org. And so uh, Gordon gets it exactly wrong. Uh, in fact, uh, I was at Monticello just last week. Uh, some friends of mine from the West Coast were here. They, they'd never been on the East Coast, and I promised them I would take them to Monticello if they ever made it because they're big Jefferson fans. So we went there, and you walk in the front door of those of you who have been to Monticello, Jefferson's home, uh, the first thing that's there is there's a bust of uh, Turgot, the French finance minister, and he was a, a precursor of the Austrian school. His name is on the wall at the Mises Institute, the name of all the famous Austrians. He's, he's one of them. And, uh, and uh, Jefferson learned a lot. The Voltaire and Tur Turgot are right there at the, the entranceway. And those are the original marble busts of, the, of these two men that are there. Hamilton, on the other hand, uh, was an ignoramus on economics. Uh, I don't know how he got this reputation. Uh, there's Jefferson studying Adam Smith and David Ricardo and Turgot and the French physiocrats. Who did Hamilton study? Well, he basically studied the pamphlets written by publicists for the British mercantilism, uh, basically. And, and, uh, he, and in his reports, his famous report on manufacturers, he said such things as... Um, International competition would make prices higher. Protectionism would make prices lower. Uh, he, he said uh, he advocated banning all imports altogether of things that, were, that we could make here in the United States, so not allowing any competition from any, any other country for the things that could be made here. If we can't raise coffee here, well, let them import coffee. But if we could make barrels, don't let anybody import barrels or woolen blankets or anything like that. So he was, these are all the arguments of the old 18th century British mercantilists made uh, that were all debunked by Adam Smith in his famous book, The Wealth of Nations. But these were Hamilton's arguments. And so the, well, here's the Wall Street Journal in 2008 mm -hmm. making the case that the cause of the crisis is not enough power in the hands of the Fed and it's because of this legacy of Thomas Jefferson and his anti-banking, his ignorant anti-banking ideas. But, of course, the real ignoramus was Hamilton and people who championed his ideas to this day, like John Steele Gordon. Uh, another one of Gordon's claims, the Civil War ended monetary chaos when Congress passed the National Bank Act. Monetary chaos was ended. Um, well, I have a, I brought a little, little quote here on that. There's been a lot of scholarship on this. Uh, there's just one, one article here that I'll mention. So did it end monetary chaos? That's what the Wall Street Journal readers are informed of by John Steele Gordon. Um, I'm going to cite an article by, these are three well-known monetary economists, Michael Bordeaux, Peter Rappaport, and Anna Schwartz. And Anna Schwartz was Milton Friedman's co-author in their famous Monetary History of the United States. 
uh, an article that was published in 1992 of theirs about this period, the, 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 uh, the post-Civil War era, the National Banking Acts that John Stuart Gordon claims ended monetary chaos. They say this, uh, the system was characterized by monetary and cyclical instability, four banking panics, frequent stock market crashes, and other financial disturbances. So that's, that's not very stable. It doesn't sound very stable uh, to me, really. Uh, he concludes uh, by saying that um, uh, what we need is, uh, let's see, oh, here it is. What we need is uh, nationalize the financial markets by assuming stock ownership. The government should assume stock ownership in banks and appoint the U.S. Treasury Secretary as essentially a financial dictator. This, he says, will take the politics out of banking. <laughs> politics out of banking. I don't know how he gets that. You know, have a, have a, 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 a political dictator. And uh, that reminds me of, uh, I didn't tell you all of my quotes from academics, but here's, uh, I, I saved this for the end here because it was related. Here's another textbook that said something like this by Jeffrey Sachs and a co-author, Felipe Lenane, I think is his last name, Macroeconomics in the Global Economy. And Jeffrey Sachs is pretty popular. He's The World Bank sent him all over Eastern and Central Europe uh, to make sure they didn't move too far in the direction of free markets after the collapse of communism. And so he became quite the celebrity. Uh, but they say this in their book on macroeconomics. In the United States, the Federal Reserve is independent from the rest of the public sector. Okay. Then the next sentence says, the Fed chairman is appointed by the president. <laughs> so how, how can you be independent of the public sector if the chairman is appointed by the president? Uh, and the, the final quote, uh, I saved this the best for last. This is uh, uh, a textbook entitled Macroeconomics by Andrew Abel and Ben Bernanke. And uh, they say, one of Congress's primary motives in establishing the Fed was the hope that a central bank would help eliminate the severe financial crises that had periodically afflicted, afflicted the United States before World War I. Okay, well, that could be true. They hoped it would eliminate these crises. And then the second sentence, I think, is really funny. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, you might, maybe you have to be an economist like me to think this is funny. The next sentence is, ironically, the most severe financial crisis in U.S. history occurred in 1930, barely a decade and a half after the creation of the Fed. So you, so you have these, uh, how ironic can you be? So you have these two brilliant MIT-trained Ph.D. economists who don't seem to have, see there any potential for a connection between the creation of the Fed and the panic that came just a few years later. And, and they're supposed to be experts in econometrics, too, you know, statistical investigation of cause and effect and, and, and all that sort of thing. And, uh, but uh, anyway, so I thought that was kind of funny. They thought it was ironic that the Fed created a, a, a crisis, just like the Bank of the United States created uh, the Panic of 1819. There's a whole history of that. And, uh, and they just don't know history. Um, uh, you, uh, if you're not, if you don't play in the same sandbox that people like George Selger and I play in, you don't know that like a lot of the economists uh, that, that uh, you hear about that teach at the universities, uh, they really don't know anything about uh, this kind of history. They, 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 they go to graduate school and are taught a lot of technical stuff uh, and they read journal articles, mostly very recent journal articles and very, very few of them. Uh, uh, do things like Murray Rothbard did, write books on the monetary history of the United mm -hmm. States. Uh, they only know the, the latest, you know, couple of years worth of journal articles and things. And so th they might be totally in the dark. Even a guy like Ben Bernanke might be totally in the dark about some of these, 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 um, these, this easily, easy to read history uh, there. And, and it sure sounds like it if you read his, you know, some of the textbooks. Let's see, how's the time going here? Um, one other thing I've mentioned, all this talk about the independent Fed, uh, I've mentioned a few of these quotes about the, the, pen, the Fed is supposedly independent, and if it's not, it should be. Uh, well, that, that is not really true. Uh, another group of um, uh, dissidents within the economics profession were uh, some of my professors at, at VPI, James Buchanan and Gordon Tullock. They were the founders of what's called the Public Choice School of Economics. It's basically the economic analysis of political decision making. And, uh, and, and some of this research uh, spilled out into monetary economics over the past 20, 25 years. 
when uh, some of the uh, people in his field started writing articles in the, in the academic journals about uh, the, the influence of politics on the Fed. You know, previously this was a, a, the unthinkable, that the Fed is independent. You know, you can, can't, have, can't have politics in government uh, when it comes to money, the money supply. Uh, but just to give you an idea of what some of these people have, have said, um, there's one, uh, one person who wasn't really a big shot in public choice, uh, but he was, he was really an excellent economist, the late Robert Weintraub. And uh, where he, one of his publications, he, he wrote how the Federal Reserve fundamentally shifted its monetary policy course in 1953, 1961, 1969, 1974, and 1977. This is one of the first articles of this type that I know of, looking at sort of the political influence of the Fed. Now, why did the Fed make all these shifts from easy money to, to you know, not so easy money, you know, you know, every time, every few years? Uh, well, here's the, the explanation. President Eisenhower wanted slower money growth. The money supply then grew at 1.73% during his administration, the slowest rate in a decade. Then President Kennedy desired a somewhat faster money creation. From January 61 to November 63, the money supply grew by 2.31%. Lyndon Johnson required rapid money creation to finance his expansion of the, the, the Vietnam War and the welfare state. Money supply grew, um, growth more than doubled. Uh, these varying rates of monetary growth all occurred under the same Fed chairman, William McChesney Martin. And the story that is told here is that if you want to keep your job and be reappointed as Fed chairman, you do what the boss wants. And the boss will let you know what he wants, the president. He'll make speeches. He'll have his people, his appointees go out and make speeches about whether the money is growing too fast or too, or too slow. And uh, you keep your ears open and you do what the boss wants if you want to be reappointed. And that's basically the story. Uh, he goes on to say uh, that uh, Arthur Burns, who was the successor, was such a staunch supporter of Nixon uh, that uh, even though his staff informed him in the fall of 1972 that the money supply was forecast to grow by a robust 10.5% in the third quarter, Burns advocated even faster growth. Uh, the growth rate in the money supply in 1972 was the fastest for any one year since the end of World War II. And of course, it helped uh, Nixon get reelected. And then, and then, of course, when Jerry Ford came in, he had his uh, whip inflation now program. People were wearing these buttons that win. You know, that, just that should make Jerry Ford go down as the dumbest president in American history. I think just just that button, that button. But that was the consequence of Nixon's reelection campaign. And this, in the literature of economics, this is this is called the political business cycle. And most of the mainstream economists don't pay much attention to this. They poo-poo it. They say it hasn't been really proven. Uh, well, yeah, the government doesn't have the ability to, to perfectly centrally plan the economy to the extent that they can create zero unemployment a month before the election that takes place and then, you know, like that. But they try their best. They do try their best to inflate before the election. And it creates all kinds of economic problems for the rest of us. And so, uh, so all this, in, in this, this rarely makes it into the textbooks. Some of them have it. Some of them do have it. But, uh, but those statements I read to you, uh, earlier, uh, make no hint of that. So you could very easily, uh, get through a class in macroeconomics at a university or monetary theory and not, not have any knowledge of this. I, one of my students came into my, uh, American economic history class, undergraduate student. He had already taken, he was an economics major, and he had already taken a, a class in intermediate macroeconomic theory, which is really the heavy duty intermediate level course that all majors take, and a, cor a, a course on monetary theory. And he comes into my class and he said, you know, I, I had no idea there were criticisms of the Fed. He said, I'd never heard this. He had had all his classes. And he was fascinated that there were actual criticisms of the Fed because he had never been uh, alerted to any of them by his two other professors who took, taught these two whole courses in, uh, in money, money in, in macro. And so uh, the man says, I have five minutes. And so what I'm going to do to close here is uh, I don't want you to be too disappointed that Lou Rockwell had to cancel. Uh, and that's too bad. And so I brought, I'm going to read you a few quotes from Lou on this topic of, uh, of the Fed and, uh, and how the mainstream miseducates. And, uh, and what I have to say here is not so much miseducation per se, but uh, they leave a lot out. Uh, from the very beginning, central banks have had as one of their primary purposes the financing of war. Uh, 
And you will rarely read anything at all about that, about the, the role of the, the central banks financing war in the mainstream uh, theory textbooks. You'll read about it at the Mises Institute and, and things like that. But you pick up one of these macroeconomics or monetary theory books, and you'll very little is, is mentioned about that. But, uh, but, but Lou has written about it very eloquently. And, of course, uh, the United States probably could not have gotten into World War I had we not had the Fed, and the income tax was created in the same year, by the way, in 1913. And here's what Lou says about it. He says, uh, when they were making the case for the Fed, no one pointed out, this is a quote, no one pointed out that this institution would permit Americans to fund without taxes the destruction of cities abroad and overthrow of governments at will. No one said that the central bank would make it possible for the U.S. to be at large-scale war in one of every four years for a century. It was never pointed out that this institution would make it possible for the U.S. government to establish a global empire that would make Imperial Rome and Britain look benign by comparison. That was never mentioned. It was always the chaos of competitive currency that was the problem. Uh, the Fed is the institution that has been required to, uh, to, to enter and, and fund all these wars. Uh, World War I, all the, all the major belligerents uh, used central banking uh, for World War I. It wasn't only just the Fed. It was uh, the Germans and it was the Russians. The Russians had their central bank. They all abandoned, uh, uh, walked away from gold and, and adopted uh, fiat money and, and, uh, and, a, and a centralized banking. And uh, Ludwig von Mises wrote this in 1919. He said, one can say without exaggeration that inflation is an indispensable means of militarism. Without it, the repercussions of war on welfare become obvious much more quickly and penetratingly. War weariness was set in much earlier. And of course, that's certainly true. If the government has to tell us today, now, okay, uh, if we, if we want to maintain these wars in Iran, in Iraq, rather, uh, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm reading too many. I'm reading the Weekly Standard too much. Uh, in, in Iraq, uh, and all, all the hopeful thinking in the Weekly Standard. Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, well, given the cost of these wars, uh, every working American will be assessed a new tax of twenty thousand dollars this year. I bet there'd be an anti-war movement uh, in America over that. But if Ben Bernanke can just push a button and print all that money. And let, and let the consequences befall us next year, the year after, and so forth, and then blame it all on capitalism. Well, that's a good, that's a good scheme, isn't it? And so, so this is what happened. And, uh, you know, the Russians, the, the Germans, by 1923, the mark had fallen to one trillionth of its 1914 value. That's what they did with their, the hyperinflation to finance uh, their, their participation in the war. In Russia, uh, they had the state bank of the Russian Empire. Uh, it was, you know, the Russian version of the Fed. And, uh, and it did the same thing. It created tremendous, uh, tremendous uh, inflation. So what Lou concludes in, in her article is that, you know, one of the things that's sort of overlooked here is that uh, central banking gave birth, to, uh, I'll, I'll quote him, to the most evil political trends in the history of the world, communism, socialism, fascism, Nazism, and the despotism of economic planning in the capitalist West. And you won't read that in these, in these uh, economics textbooks, but I believe it's, <clears throat> it's absolutely true that that is what has happened. And uh, if, if you really want to follow up on this, Joe Salerno has an excellent article called War and the Money Machine, in, uh, and it's in uh, the, the Mises Institute book on uh, the cost of war, but it's also online. So if you just were, go online and type in jo Joseph P. Salerno in War and the Money Machine, it's, it's a great exposition of uh, war and inflation. And so uh, I think it's, my time is about up. Thank you all for supporting the Mises Institute. Remember, we won't allow you to exit this room unless you do sign up uh, so that we can give you one of those books on the presidency. And I will sign them if you ask me to. Thank you very much.